is set in a dystopian political future in which the government maintains a fascist control of the people through uh, a complete control of the media and a constant barrage of lies and propaganda. My love for this film requires no explanation. <laughs> the plot revolves around a character who wears a Guy Fawkes mask who is planning to complete the gunpowder plot of 1605 and succeed in blowing up the parliament building in order to awaken and unite the people to stand up to their fascist government. The subtext of the narrative is that Fox can still inspire action even 400 years after his execution. The main character of V knows that he will die in the process of carrying out his plot, but he is assured that his survival is irrelevant. The point is that the idea of the revolution that needs to happen the idea of freedom, of democracy, of justice, are ideas and as such they cannot be killed. Ideas, V says, are bulletproof. Though entirely fictional, martyrdom in order to immortalize an idea does have many historical precedents. Many of us here can remember the June of 1963 when the Vietnamese Buddhist monk Phic Quang Duc burned himself to death in a busy intersection in Saigon. His public martyrdom drew attention to the injustice of the Vietnam War and was at least a part of the beginning of the turn of sentiment in the public in the United States uh, in response to this protest. I was in my first year of seminary in the spring of 1980 and had only just been introduced to liberation theology when Archbishop Oscar Romero was assassinated by an American-trained and funded political assassin in El Salvador, trained at Fort Benning's, Georgia, at the School of the Americas. One of his aides came and spoke to us at the Vanderbilt Chapel that next month, giving us an eyewitness account of the murder of this liberation theology icon. The progressive priests of Central and South America were systematically captured tortured, and many were murdered in the years that followed, all with the blessings of a very conservative Vatican administration that chose to ally itself with brutal dictators because they were so afraid of socialism. God forbid the poor should get to eat. The current pope, though he was a part of the machinery that silenced liberationists in Argentina, the current pope gave the names of liberation theology priests to those who were arresting and murdering them. Now he's trying to assuage the Catholic Church's collective guilt by having Romero canonized as a saint, which of course is not something that Romero would have wanted and completely misses the point. But as I have observed before, if all you have is a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail. The one thing the Catholic Church can do, certainly not confess their sins, but they can make their mistakes into saints. The Catholic Church is guilty of having cooperated with the arrest, torture, and murder of their own priests, something that they have yet to admit. Not at all unlike the way our country has treated the 1964 assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. We cannot canonize saints through our federal government, but we can make his birthday a federal holiday and then named the most dangerous streets and parts of town after him in every major city in the country. Now even conservative politicians try to use King's name in quotes to polish their own reputations while trying to ignore absolutely everything that he ever said. But, men and women, ideas are bulletproof. And even from his grave, King still inspires and speaks to us. Of course, we're gathered here on Easter, following the traditional observance of the events of the Christian Holy Week in which the world's best-known martyr is remembered. Now, it's important to be aware that the oldest biblical account of the crucifixion is not in the Gospels. It's actually in Paul's letters. Paul wrote about 50 years before the Gospels were written. 
And in Paul's description of the resurrection, there is no empty tomb. Paul doesn't even suggest that anyone encountered the body, a risen body of Jesus. <coughs> Paul, he never met Jesus himself. He never knew him in the flesh, and he didn't have a lot of historical details. But he insists that Peter, James, John, all the rest saw a vision. There's no implication that this was literal. The first of the can, uh, canonical Gospels, Mark, does speak of an empty tomb, but there are no appearances. Those of us uh, who read in on Jesus Seminar material have read the Gospel of Thomas, which probably predates the four Gospels in the New Testament, and it does not mention a resurrection at all. But at the end of the first century, the church added narratives. Luke had already been written much earlier, and it did not have resurrection appearances. Proto-Luke, the first version of Luke. But in Rome, uh, many years after the author of Luke is dead, they added resurrection appearances to that. Because Jesus was being tamed and transformed from a message of liberation theology into a message of um, compliance, offering an illusory promise of an eternal life after death. The church, conspiring with political authorities of the day, tried to kill the message of radical compassion taught by Jesus, the revolution that he started, and replaced it with what Karl Marx very accurately described as the opiate of the people, a religious narrative intended to keep the poor and enslaved quiet and cooperative. A lot of my peers uh, in the traditional church think that I am somewhat uniquely radical in my representing of the Jesus narrative, but I want to leave it to the words of Thomas Jefferson, who in 1814 wrote a letter to Horatio Spafford, and he said it better than I ever could. Thomas Jefferson says, the priest has always been hostile to liberty. He is always in alliance with the despot, abating his abuses in return for protection of his own. It's easier to acquire wealth and power by this combination than by deserving them. And to effect this, they have perverted the purest religion ever preached to man into mystery and jargon unintelligible to all humankind and therefore the safer engine for their purposes. Thank you, Thomas Jefferson. Some months ago, David Ketchum and I were attending an organizing event for transgender rights and we heard Violet in the undercurrent sing just a couple of songs. And when I heard them sing the line, they tried to bury us, they tried to sweep us under, they tried to silence us. But after the thunder comes the rain, and after the rain comes the pain, and from the pain a seed will grow taller than the sky. I turned to David and said, that's the Easter message. That's what we want to go for. They tried to bury us. They just didn't know that we were seeds. A government killed Jesus, and the church tried to bury him in a message of magic and superstition. And yet thousands of years later, some can still hear him calling us to a peaceful revolution. A government killed Dietrich Bonhoeffer at the end of the Second World War, and generations of seminary professors, I can tell you from existential experience, tried to make him so boring it would absolutely cure insomnia. <laughs> but his, yeah, you had to sit through that too. But his death reminds the church that it is our job to stand up to fascism. Our government, working with a despot in El Salvador, killed Archbishop Romero. Assassins killed Gandhi, JFK, Bobby Kennedy, and Martin Luther King Jr. But ideas are bulletproof. They tried to sweep them under. Since they were killed, governments have tried to silence their voices, tried to scare the rest of us with thunder. They buried them. They just didn't know that they were seeds. We are not keepers of a dead religion here, encased in magical thinking and silly childish promises of some kind of literal heaven or frightened by the fires of an imaginary hell. We are the one thing that governments and institutional churches fear the most. We are awake. We have an idea. And as long as we refuse to be frightened into silence, or even to play dead, which is what they really want from us, 
because they know all that stands between us and the end of fascism, what has kept us from real liberation is that we are not united and fully aware. All we have to do is wake up and stick together. Now, whether our generation will awaken from its childish indifference or not remains to be seen. But this much I'm sure of, the world is ripe for a revolution, a reformation in economics, in government, and in religion. And whether it happens in my lifetime or not, I cannot predict. I just know that it should. No, that is right. 
Because it's Easter, it's unavoidable that we think about martyrdom and consider how even execution or murder has not ended the influence of some of our most inspiring statesmen and prophets. But realistically, if Easter is only meaningful for martyrs, then it becomes far too much of a history lesson, an idolizing of past heroes, and not nearly personal enough. Sure. <coughs> An assassin killed Martin Luther King Jr. But long before what James Earl Ray did on his own, the FBI, under the leadership of J. Edgar Hoover, was bugging his hotel rooms and building a fire, a file of mudslinging evidence of affairs, alcohol abuse, and they were even trying to tie him to the Soviet Communist Party. For the most part, governments, the church, corporations and political parties don't so much physically assassinate their opposition, they do it through character assassination, through rumors, insults, inference, and lies. I suspect that even some of you felt a real sense of satisfaction in the arrest of Julian Assange because the United States government has spent more than a decade trying to tell you to despise him and have heaped up false and exaggerated allegations to turn the public against him. And even trying to read between the lines, it does seem like Julian can be something of a jerk. Um, in many ways, over the years of unjust uh, virtual incarceration in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, Julian has been pushed into an unholy alliance with the propaganda arm of Russia but you need to remember that it didn't start that way. I would beg you to consider two things. First of all, he became an enemy of the Bush, Obama, and Trump administrations because he was telling the truth about government abuses that our government did not want the public to know. First and foremost, beyond all personal foibles and mistakes that Julian Assange has made, you have been asked to hate him because he revealed the truth about illegal spying on American citizens and for war crimes that involved the murder of multiple journalists and aid workers in Iraq and Afghanistan. And as painful as it may be to consider, far beyond whatever Assange has done wrong, the real criminals in this scenario are named George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump. I know that it's so different from almost everything else that you've ever heard that it's likely to be difficult for you to believe me. Just let me quote the guy that many of us here have acknowledged as being the smartest 
living man in the world today, Noam Chomsky. Chomsky wrote, the Assange arrest is scandalous in several respects. One of them is just the effort of governments, and it's not just the U.S. government. The British are cooperating. Ecuador, of course, is now cooperating. Sweden before had cooperated. The efforts to silence a journalist who was producing materials that people in power didn't want the rascal multitudes to know about, okay? That's basically what happened. WikiLeaks was producing things that people ought to know about those in power. People in power don't like that. So therefore, we have to silence it, okay? This is the kind of thing, the kind of scandal that takes place, unfortunately, over and over. End of quote from Noam Chomsky. The second thing I want to say about this is that the government always goes after low-hanging fruit in order to open the door to a new universe of abuses. Assange is not innocent of wrongdoing, and he has been successfully smeared in the minds of the public to make his arrest acceptable and even laudable to most people. But please don't kid yourselves. We have an administration that has been busy building a fascist government for two years, in part through attacks on legitimate journalists of all sorts, including threats to sue or imprison journalists for telling the truth. Do you think that the Trump administration's whitewashing of the Saudi torture and murder through dismemberment of Jamal Khashoggi was out of loyalty to Saudi, uh, Saudi uh, royalty? Or wasn't it more a kind of palpable envy? Don't you see that Trump would like very much to do to many journalists in America exactly what was done to Jamal Khashoggi? You may be hearing it here the first time, but trust me, you're going to hear about it a lot more in the future. The arrest of Julian Assange sets a precedent for arresting and harassing more and more journalists in order to silence criticisms in the media of a dishonest and probably treasonous president. I take no pleasure in being right about this. I just am. In our day, it is legally difficult to crucify, assassinate, or incarcerate our prophets. But character assassination is alive and well, and reaching a point of artistic perfection. As you know, Dr. Paul Tomlinson and I have just returned from a 10-day road trip delivering lectures and providing consults in eight different events in South Carolina. And added to that uh, exhaustive trip, we took side trips to Asheville, North Carolina, Charleston and Hilton Head, South Carolina, and Savannah, Georgia, where I am actually on a radio program weekly. But the best part of the trip for me was getting to spend days in conversation between two old friends who have seen each other through all of the successes and failures that life has dished out to us over the 25 years of our friendship. Paul very articulately came to my defense a dozen years ago when I was being tried in a Christian church kangaroo court dismissing me from my former denomination. And I championed his prospects of becoming the next director of the Borough Mental Health Board before a third world style coup of heartbreaking proportions saw him not only passed over but unemployed. In both of our cases, people we had worked with, people we trusted and loved, conspired to end our careers through falsehood and manipulation. But as Paul summed it all up, we ain't done yet. We both suffered months of unemployment and, the, and dramatic reductions in compensation, but folks, freedom isn't free. You don't get to be a prophet unless you're willing to bear some scars in the process. Our liberation came at a price, and there had been a lot of lost sleep and some real emotional trauma involved in it, but we recognize now that we are both more effective and have a larger impact than we ever would have if we had not been kicked to the curb by people who, frankly, did not deserve our association in the first place. The metaphor of resurrection is not about a literal empty tomb from which a formerly dead prophet comes back to life to live forever in the clouds. 
the real power of the resurrection is possibly expressed best in the prophetic words of Chumbawamba. I get knocked down, but I get up again, and you're never going to keep me down. You know this song, don't you? And that is not the first time I've used that in church. <laughs> the hope inherent in the Easter message is not that you will one day be issued a pair of wings and a harp and you'll never have to suffer again. The hope inherent in the Easter message is that neither bullets nor nails nor divorce, unemployment, bankruptcy, heartbreak, cancer, old age, or being outnumbered by uninformed, uneducated, mouth-breathing, knuckle-dragging political fascists will ever silence us as long as we refuse to be frightened. Resurrection is at the heart of a revolution that will change Christianity, Judaism, Islam. It will change America and England and Europe. It will be the downfall of despots and dictators, ideologues, and the greedy hoarders of the world's wealth. As Pete Buttigieg said so well this week, we're not trying to win an election. We're trying to win an era. We're not interested in just peaching the Clementine Caligula. We want to save the planet. We don't want to be forced into the false dichotomy of choosing between rebuilding Notre Dame or giving the yellow vest protesters a living wage. There's no reason to not have both, to value humanity and cherish human accomplishment. We're not going to be fished into a false battle between traditional Democrats and Democratic Socialists, nor are we going to lower ourselves into blaming immigrants and terrorists for our country's serious economic disparity. We're either here to change the world, or you came to the wrong damn party. <laughs> As our friends sing very prophetically, because you've got the magic it takes and you know it, now there's nothing that's going to slow you down. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.